Move out of the way, I said with a frown. She walked her way. Her little heart was broken. I didn't realize how harshly I had spoken. While I lay awake in bed, God's still small voice came to me and said, while dealing, while dealing with a stranger, common courtesy you use, but the children you love, you seem to abuse. Are we that way sometimes? We're nice to others, but around our families, we're not quite as nice. Look on the kitchen floor. You'll find some flowers there by the door. Those are the flowers she brought for you. She picked them herself, pink, yellow, and blue. She, she stood quietly, not to spoil the surprise, and you never saw the tears in her eyes. By this time, I felt very small, and now my tears began to fall. I quietly went and knelt by her bed. Wake up, little girl. Wake up, I said. Are these the flowers you picked for me? She smiled. I found them out by the tree. I picked them because they're pretty like you, Mom. I knew you'd like them, especially the, the blue. I said, Daughter, I'm sorry for the way I acted today. I shouldn't have yelled at you that way. She said, Oh, Mommy, that's okay. I love you anyway. Would you love us like that? I said, Daughter, I love you too. And I love the flowers, especially the blue. Think about this. If we die tomorrow, the company that we're working for could easily replace us in a matter of days, the ones that are working somewhere. But the family we would leave behind would feel the loss for the rest of their lives. Now think about it and be honest. Do we, do, do we or did we put as much time and effort into our families as we do our jobs? Any time I think we don't. Most of us put much more of ourselves into our jobs and into our families. At the end of their lives, no one has ever said, I really wish I'd spent more time at work. And many say, I really wish I'd spent more time with my family. Tell your loved ones how much you love them often because you don't know when it might be the last opportunity. All right, I, I have some copies of that. I'm uh, going to turn the same. Get your mask. Up there, Joe. <laughs> One of these days, we won't have to have
And she has pictures she's going to show for everybody. I tried to get let me hook it up to the thing. Let's do a slideshow. <laughs> so if you want to see the baby pictures, just see her after service. Okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> or me. I've got plenty too. Yeah. <laughs> she's not a grandma. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> not this grandma. She's an aunt. We have a great grandma with <laughs> But it's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Good to see each one of you. And it's always good to be in the Lord's house. Take a look at your bulletin. Let me remind you of a couple of things. Uh, this week, uh, we have a mission meeting on Thursday, so be mindful of that. Uh, we also, uh, some candy's been brought, but we're going to be providing candy for all kids who come for the fish fry. So please help us with that. Uh, you can bring that next Sunday. Uh, October the 30th is my fish fry, fall festival, all kind of combined, so be mindful of that and continue to be in prayer for that. Invite people to come. Randy's going to provide, he's going to go fishing this week, make sure we have plenty of fish. I got a cough drop in my mouth, so if I can't stop sounding right, that's the reason. Yes, ma'am. Um, are they putting the candy in a little bag or what? So I've got some bags I'll bring. Are we, if they don't, we need to show up and give them a big bag. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Just a reminder, we will be, uh, the actual backpacks have to be delivered a week from Monday through next week. So thank y'all for everything y'all done. Okay, you need anything that we? Still need a few things, but we'll get it to them. <laughs> Continue to remember the prayer needs that we have to continue to remember the good old family in your prayers. Bubba uh, is in Jackson. And Miss Kathleen? I want to thank everybody for their prayers. And they still need prayers. And little Morgan is still at Mulder. Okay. So I'll be much in prayer for Morgan and uh, lift her up. And uh, Mason and Savannah both are... At home, okay. Mama? Yeah. Okay. And Morgan, Mason is better. He got to go back to school. Okay. Good. So remember this family, continue to lift him up and continue to remember each and every other prayer need that we have. Pray for Randy. He's not doing exactly what the doctor told him to do. You don't know that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> Oh, we'll pray for Miss Virginia. Lift her up in your prayers. And Gail and Kathy both. Good to see Larry here this morning. Amen. He, stand, he stands out this morning. He's got a bright colored shirt on. He had a birthday yesterday. He had a birthday. Happy birthday. Well, let's say happy birthday to him. Happy birthday. Everybody at the church this morning. 
Y'all don't see the look on her face when she said that. You have to you don't have to understand the preacher's kind of odd sometimes. I'd like to see the front of his face. I can see the side. <laughs> He's looking at you now. Yeah, when, he, when you said that, it's a shock on his face. <laughs> preacher does that a lot of times. His face didn't change. <laughs> she was hoping she had. Let's get our hymn books and turn to hymn number 499, Victory in Jesus. Let's sing all three verses. Four ninety nine. <laughs>
And number 626, I'd love to tell the story. This is one of my favorites. 626, let us stand as we sing and prepare our hearts for the story. <clears throat> Today, 
says this, the demon enters, it is true, as a squatter and not as an owner or a guest or one who has a right to be there. He comes in as an intruder and as an invader and as an enemy. But come he does if the door is opened by serious and protracted sin. I want to look at that last statement that I made. If your life is not filled with the Holy Spirit, I'll give me the illustration. I got a glass here. This is really for the end of the sermon this morning. Now let me ask you a question. Is that glass filled? You filled it up so it's full. <laughs> but there's still room for more. But in your mind, you stop there, so you believe that's all you want to put in. No, no. <laughs> you, you're not you make an assumption of that. You done stop. So once you stop, it's full. <laughs> in your mind, I always wanted to get it right. <laughs> Many of us go through life saying, well, I'm filled. Ephesians chapter 5, 18 says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to fill it all the way to the top. Now, can I add anything else to that? <laughs> this is filling out all over the table. That's the reason I had to take it. Don't let me preach. You said when you poured it be the end of the sermon. <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> I don't think I said that. Yes, you did. No. I got witnesses. No. I got witnesses. No. <laughs> He said he was going to do it. My, my, my message this morning is really one that the devil does not want me to preach. <laughs> and, and he's demonizing people in this congregation. <laughs> and I'm going to explain that in a few minutes. <laughs> Satan's plan has a plan against believers. He doesn't not worry about unbelievers because he's already got them. Satan cannot rob you of your eternal life. Amen? Amen. Amen. But he can rob you of the joy, the influence, and the rewards of your Christian life by constantly afflicting you in life. And he does it through three primary strategies that we've already looked at. He wants to discourage you from worshiping God. What a beautiful day it is today. Amen. We're getting ready for fall. The leaves are going to start changing. Praise God in His nature that He's given us. Satan doesn't want you to praise the Lord by worshiping Him. He also wants to distract you from serving the Lord. We just sing a song that talked about praising the name of the Lord and, and telling other people and yet, folks, we kind of sung that song in a drab note this morning. It ought to be a sound of joy that we have the ability and the privilege of sharing the good news with other people. I'm going to have to say that again. I didn't get any response out of that. Every day you have the privilege and the responsibility to share the good news with everybody you meet. Amen. And so the devil wants to distract us from serving God and he wants to deceive us into disobeying God. Last Sunday I looked at the, the demons in our world today. We need to understand that, again, make this statement, Satan cannot be in more than one place at one time because he is a created being. He is limited in the sense that we are limited. But Satan has a demonic host 
that fell out of the glory of heaven that he has at his beck and call. In the book of Ephesians, it taught we don't serve, you know, people we would serve principalities and so forth and so on. Now, how do Satan's demons work? How do they invade our life? I'm going to say some things this morning. You're going to have a little bit of a question, but stay with me all the way through. Since Satan cannot be in more than one place at one time, how does he discourage us, distract us, and deceive us? Well, he uses a variety of means. One, he can do it through nature. Listen to the Word of God. John chapter 12, verse 31 is the verse for our text this morning. Jesus is just entered Jerusalem. He just come over the Mount of Olives. He's looking down toward the city of Jerusalem. This is the place where the Bible says that Jesus wept over the city. But there were some men, Greek men, who came to Philip and Andrew and said, We would see Jesus. And they come and report that to Jesus. But then Jesus answered them in verse 30 and 31. And he said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. If you go back and read, he is saying, Father, glorify thy name in me. They're trying to get, Satan is using other people to try to get Jesus not to go to the cross. Folks, if Jesus had not gone to the cross and died for us, we would not have salvation. So he's trying, to, he's even trying to get Jesus to disobey the Father. But Jesus said, these words have come for your sakes. Now the judgment of this world, now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Jesus is going to condemn the demons. But the, he is the ruler of this world in this passage of Scripture. He's the prince of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, he's described as the prince of the power of the air. Now can somebody tell me an incident in Scripture for demons use nature to attack God's people? Huh? Snake in the Garden of Eden. Snake in the Garden of Eden? Uh, I, I'm thinking a little bit more correct. Job chapter 1. God used, the, the demons used the wind to destroy the elder son of Job's house and kill all of Job's children. Notice what I'm saying is that Satan is sometimes can use the wind, the rain, the hurricanes and tornadoes to attack us, to afflict us, to distract us. Second, he can do it through illness. Now, to blame every illness on demonic activity is neither logical nor biblical. Some of our illnesses are the results of our inhabiting a sin-cursed body in this sin-cursed world. Because our bodies have inherited Adam's curse, we contract illnesses, and we die. But there are times when our diseases are precipitated by demonic activity. Let me give you an illustration. Mark chapter 1, verses 32 and 34. The gospel writer here is describing the healing ministry of Jesus. The gospel writer, Mark in this case, distinguishes between sicknesses that were caused by demons and by those that were not. Listen to the Word of God. Mark chapter 1, verses 32 and 34. And in the evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. Notice the distinction. Those that were diseased, and those that were possessed with devils. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils. Here's my point. If all illness is caused by demons, then he would not have said they that were diseased. He would simply say they that were possessed of demons. Now, if every illness is caused by demons, Mark would have distinguished that for us. But don't underestimate the ability of, the, of Satan, our adversary, to use his demons to afflict us. 
and he will do so in everything. Thirdly, he doesn't do mental disorders. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher, I'm not sure I believe that. Listen to me. It is a mistake to say that all mental illness is caused by demons. But when I asked a, when I asked a Christian psychiatrist back years and years ago, I asked him this question, what is the relationship between mental illness and demonic activity? His response with the question to me is that if mental disorders are the result of demonic activity, then why do the symptoms all, almost always disappear when treated with the right drugs? That's a good question. But our thoughts and our emotions are directly traceable to a series of electrical and chemical reactions in our brains. Folks, you need to understand, God fearfully and wonderfully made us. You've got a computer up here that's better than any human computer on the face of this earth. But because of the electrical and chemical impulses that are there, good drug, drug therapy can restore those things. However, our thoughts and emotions are more than a series of electrical and chemical impulses. They, they, there's an immeasurable and very real spiritual component to your mind. And Satan will attack you right here. Amen? So, if, if there is stress going on in your life and despair and so forth, Satan will attack you and his demons will attack you in your brain. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. One of the ways to stay free from the demonic activity is to maintain your prayer life. To maintain thanksgiving in your life. Give God praise and glory. Amen? Amen. When you're having a blue day, start praising Jesus. Start singing songs of praise to Him. Get your mind off of that which is causing you to be blue and get your mind on God. That's what God wants us to do. Go with me to Luke chapter 8. I referred to this last Sunday. It is a beautiful illustration. Jesus has entered the land of the Gadarenes. And as he does so, verse 27, And when he went forth the land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, and wore no clothes, and neither vote in the house, but in the tombs. So as Jesus enters the land of the Gadarenes, he is immediately confronted by this, we would call him a demon-possessed man. The Bible says he had devils a long time. And when Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion. For I have many devils in me. <clears throat> but I want you to notice something about this demon. Are these demons. I think there's a head demon and then other demons. He says to Jesus in verse 28, What I have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of God Most High. Understand the devils know who Jesus is. They know that He is the Son of God. They know that He is the Son of the Most High God. And He says unto them, I be, unto Jesus, I beseech thee, torment me not. They understand the power of Jesus to torment, to condemn them to the abyss. And so the devil is basically saying here, don't confine me to the bit. Send me into the herd of swine. And that's the picture in this passage of Scripture. Now, somebody tell me a little bit about swine for a moment. How do the Jews view pigs? They were unclean. They're not kosher. So in the land of the gatherings, he's in the area of the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles are raising pigs not Jews. This is on the east side of Galilee. And when Jesus finally released him from the demonic possession, 
and sent the demons away into the herd of swine. The swine ran off the cliff down into the Sea of Galilee and drowned. The pigs couldn't even stand the demons. So why do we tolerate demonic activity in and around our lives? Because we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not letting God control every part of our lives. And when you don't, when it's not filled to the brim, folks, then Satan's got an area to come in and afflict you. Do you understand that? So God wants us to understand that. The another area that Satan can and the demons can afflict us. And I'm a little bit leery of saying this, but it is through suicide. Let me give you a verse of scripture. Mark chapter 9, verse 22. <clears throat> Mark the cha ninth chapter. We read of this little boy. And this is in a passage of scripture that talks about the powerlessness of the disciples. The disciples are trying to do things that Jesus was doing, and they, at this point in time, did not have the power to do it. <coughs> in verse 22, it said, Oftentimes this young boy cast himself into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us, and help us. Here was a young child that for whatever reason the demons had afflicted him and was to try and destroy his life by casting him into fire into the waters. Understand with me something very clearly. The natural instinct of the human being is to preserve life. We don't have any desire to take life. So for this young boy to try to destroy his life indicates the demonic possession in his life. And John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus refers to Satan as a murderer and liar. It is no accident that the Lord associates these two activities with each other. One of the strategies of Satan as he attempts to afflict us is to rob us of our life, to rob us of our influence for God and our future rewards in heaven. Amen? You or someone you know can no doubt relate to what I'm telling you. In my ministry, I have had more occasions to deal with suicide than I like. But it happens. And all of us have said, had thoughts at times that are not necessarily good thoughts. I can remember on occasions driving down the road with three girls in the seat behind me. Hollering, are we there yet, Daddy? And screaming and poking each other and carrying on with each other. And you have the thought, what about driving in the other lane of traffic on cut? You're frustrated. Amen? Amy's going to get frustrated one of these days when that baby starts really whooping and hollering. And we all seem to have those tendencies in our life. We've witnessed many things, but God wants us to experience victory in our life. Another thing that, he, that Satan does is he does it through other people. Here's the thing that really bothers me as being a pastor of a church. Two, three, four. This is the fifth church I have pastored. And in the five churches that I've pastored, including this one, I have all kinds of different experiences. I would like to say that Satan is forbidden to enter this building. But I guarantee you, Satan is in church, or his demons are in church, every Sunday that you're in church. And many times, 
The demons will get people to say things that are not right, that are not true, in order to destroy and dis disrupt the work of God in every place that he goes. And Satan can use born-again believers to say things that are improper. Notice what I'm saying, folks. When, when, when somebody says something and you want to respond, you need to back up and ask yourself, how do I respond? And in what way do I respond? You don't need to just to immediately pop off an answer because immediately popping off an answer may be the wrong answer. You with me? I served on the state executive board for many years. Good Christian men, women from all over the state. But occasionally somebody would say something totally inappropriate that would disrupt the meeting. And that's what Satan loves to do. And he will do in all of our lives. Demons use other people to discourage others. Look back in, in Luke chapter 8 again. In this passage of Scripture, this demon is named Legion. A legion in the Roman legion was 6,000 men in the army. They can number anywhere between 3 and 6,000. But can you imagine a man like Legion being in our church? How much discouragement, how much distraction, how much disobedience he would inspire. Folks, we need to understand what's going on. The verbal attack of other people is very important. Now, let me get to the heart of my question this morning. Here's my question. Can Christians be demon-possessed? Let me ask the second question. Can Christian people be demonized? Yes. Let me give you a passage of Scripture. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1. Ephesians is an awesome book. And it talks about, number one, you need to understand that you are possessed by God. When you were born and saved by the grace of God, God owns you at that point. Lock, stock, and barrel. Now, understand something very clearly with me. There's a difference between God possessing us and us being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you agree, say amen. Amen. Every born again child of God is owned by God. We belong to Him. God does not tolerate dual ownership. But He does tell us in Ephesians chapter 5, therefore be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled there is a nautical term that refers to the wind engaging the sails on a boat to push it across the water. That is an action that occurs more than one time. If I take this glass and I drink water out of it, then it's not filled anymore, but then I can fill it again. Amen? Amen. And so God wants us to continually, and, and the, part of it is an active participle in the Greek that means that you continually are being Field. Don't misunderstand the passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, I believe it is. Is that right? Be not drunk with wine away in his excess, but be filled. Be continually filled is really what it should read. You feel it today, you feel it tomorrow, you feel it the next day. So we're to constantly be fulfilled, fulfilled or filled with the Lord the Holy Spirit of God. Now, when I talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, let me give you some illustrations. Matthew chapter 16, verse 22. 
Let me turn to the verse. If some of y'all turn it to Matthew chapter 16, verse 22. Jesus has just foretold to his disciples that I must need go to Calvary and die. Peter, who is generally the outspoken of the disciples, said, Lord, that will not happen. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to die. And I will do everything I can, can and do to keep you from doing that. But in this chapter, verse 22, it says that Peter took him and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. In other words, you're not going to die like this. But look at verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, he's talking to his disciple, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Was he saying that Peter is demon-possessed? No. But he was being influenced by the demonic activity around them. In the last few weeks of Jesus' life, the devil was doing everything he could to distract Jesus from the cross. And the devil is going to do the same thing in our life to distract us from serving and obeying God. Amen? Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Again, I just read that verse. There is another instance. You know, I've had people say, well, preacher, that, that passage in Matthew is before Pentecost. It's a, a different scenario. Well, let me give you a scenario after Pentecost. In the book of Acts, there's a man by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Barnabas had <coughs> given all that he had in offering to the church. And people were applauding him for what he'd done. And so Ananias and Sapphira sold property and gave an offering to the church. But it was not the whole offering. They withheld some of it. And the apostle knew what had happened and he said to them, this is in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, he said unto Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you a question. Were Ananias and Sapphira saved? They were part of the early church, yes. But the, Peter is saying then, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the price? And at that point in time, the Holy Spirit of God struck Ananias dead on the spot. Right in front of the whole church. Folks, that would have been a good place to take the offering. It would have been the biggest offering they'd ever received. But here was a person, Ananias and Sapphira, who were in, being demon-influenced, demonized in what they were doing. Now, back to my illustration. Here's a cup that I filled up. God says, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Every day be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every hour be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's the reason why. If the cup it's not filled completely. No, but there are some areas in your life when that cup is not filled that can be influenced by the devil. <laughs> this is the one I can drink. <laughs> Diet Dr. Pepper. But I'm trying to notice something about this cup. It's not filled. Our life is not filled. Therefore, it can be an area where Satan enters in and begins to afflict you, distract you, to disobedience. 
My illustration is this, folks. We have a choice between this and that. Are we going to be filled with the Holy Spirit each and every day? And let the Holy Spirit control every area of our life? Or are we going to be content with being half filled and let the devil enter in and influence us in ways to disobey, to distract from serving God and not being what God wants us to be? The choice is ours. The choice is yours. Do I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Or do I want to allow Satan areas in which he can come into my life? question is yours. The devil is real. He's not some figment of the imagination. Demons are real. And demons want to destroy your life and your service for God. If you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, then you allow them to come into other areas of your life. That's the issue we have before us. Next couple of Sundays, I'm going to look at the strategies that God has for us to defeat the devil. And God's going to bless us in that share in that time together. Can you bow with me in prayer, please? Lord, we thank you for your love and your blessings. Thank you, Father, for your grace upon us. God is Father this day as we worship you. And Father, give us the victory that you have for us in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The stand is going to come and lead us. What number, please, ma'am? 436. 436. Don't knock my glasses off, okay? <laughs>